Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 50. That's right, we made it to 50 episodes. It's episode 50 of Frank O's World. I'm the host, Franklin Miller, and today's episode is very special because we have an esteemed guest. We have sportscaster, author, undisputed, bread breaking champion of at least Mon County, <laughs> Mr. Tony Caridi. Tony, how are we doing? I'm well, Franklin. How are you? I'm doing pretty all right. I'm doing pretty all right, as well as one can during uh, quarantine. I understand. Congratulations. 50 episodes is hard to get to, and congratulations to that. Thank you. I mean, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into this. A lot of uh, evenings where I have to drive to McDonald's because my Wi-Fi and my childhood home is woeful because I'm out here in the sticks of West Virginia. It's okay. I'm not mad about it. It's just the situation that I'm in. I understand. No, I, I completely get it. So you, uh, not only do you have 50 episodes, but you also uh, deserve an award for dedication. You know, there's something called pod fade. Have you ever heard of that term? No, I have not. So people start a podcast and they've got great excitement and they're fired up to do a podcast, which is totally cool. And then they do a few and then they go like, whoa, this isn't exactly what I thought this was like. And this is kind of fill in the blank, monotonous, um, time consuming. And so people start them, but they fade away. Mm -hmm. And there's an amazing percentage of podcasts that have been started, but are now pretty much dormant. So for you to keep churning, congratulations. Well, I greatly appreciate that. Any compliment coming from you is Hanging on the mantle, that's hanging on the mantle. It's an incredible compliment. So thank you very much. I think it's almost been a year. I skip. I had to skip one week because I was in Europe, and then I skipped last week because I wanted to save episode fifty for you, the big man. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, buddy. I don't know about big man, but I appreciate that. Well, people don't know this, but you're very tall. You could have played power forward for Jim Beheim at Syracuse. Now at pri no six four guard. I mean, and at the big boy level of basketball, uh, high school, yeah, forward. Uh, college basketball nowadays six four. That's a nice. That's a nice two guard. That is These nice two. But can you shoot? You got the long range shot. Oh, I couldn't play a lick. I can. I, yeah. I do what I can do on a basketball court, which is announce it. I'd rather. I mean, I was just okay. I was nothing. I was nothing special. Right. 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 But I mean, Syracuse. That's where all illustrious uh, sportscasters or any sort of people where their voices are heard. I feel like that's where they all come from. It's a hotbed up there. Yeah, it's got an incredible tradition, which started decades ago, way, way back. Um, and like in the 19, you know, late 40s and 50s, there was a gentleman by the name of Marty Glickman. And Marty Glickman attended Syracuse and was a world-class runner and actually participated in the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. He became a sportscaster, and he became a play-by-play -play announcer in New York. And he was, you know, at the absolute top of the game. And um, Mar Marv Albert was one of his um, protégés. And Marv Albert learned from Marty Glickman. And as the story goes, uh, Marty Glickman was, uh, during the basketball season, was on assignment overseas. I believe it was France. And he could not get back to the U.S. in time for a basketball game that he had. He was the uh, Knicks play-by-play -play announcer. So mm -hmm. he called Marv Albert, who was still in school at Syracuse at the time. And Marv went back to the city, did the game. And that was the beginning of Marv Albert's career. And that was also the end of Marv, El Ar Marv Albert's days at Syracuse. He never graduated. Uh, he went on to become obviously, uh, you know, an iconic broadcaster. But from that, you know, spawned so many different guys that have come through there uh, along the years, uh, you know, from Bob Costas, uh, among others. You could just go down the list, right? From Ted Koppel, Bob Costas, Dick Stockton, uh, on and on and on and on. I, I was fortunate enough to be in a really a super talented class um, yeah. with a two year span of, um, of, of our class. Uh, Greg Papa uh, was in the same you know year that I was. Greg is a longtime voice of the uh, Oakland Raiders. He just jumped over to the San Francisco 49ers this year before he, he was probably in the NBA 15 or 20 years. Sean McDonough, mm -hmm. 
uh, who was, um, who is, you know, a prominent announcer now on ESPN, was the youngest guy to ever broadcast the World Series on CBS, among his other assignments. And we've got guys that, you know, voice of the Cincinnati Bengals and Bearcats and Philadelphia Flyers and Phillies and on and on mm-hmm. it goes. And yeah, so they're all over the place. And um, we at, in Morgantown, I was the first Syracuse guy to come down here. And from that, we hired a bunch of Syracuse kids for a number of years who have gone on and done extremely well. Dave Pash, uh, who is uh, on ESPN, uh, voice of uh, you know the NBA on, on, on ESPN, along with college football. He's also the voice of the Arizona Cardinals. Dave Jagler was in Morgantown. He's the voice of the Washington Nationals. Uh, Dave Ryan, for years, was on ESPN, now CBS College Sports. Um, so we've got a, I mean, there's just, that's just a, I mean, Sagar Magani's the national security correspondent for the Associated Press. Uh, Charlie Palello is one of the top talk show guys in Houston. So we've had this kind of little feeder. We had a feeder system for a number of years and, uh, it, it turned out to be a good thing. It's just incredible that you got Syracuse fingerprints all over the nation. It's a hotbed up there. Yeah. Like what are we doing? What? Yeah. You know, a lot of these guys, I mean, a lot of these guys have West Virginia, uh, connections. Uh, Bill Roth is another guy who hired Bill Roth right out of Syracuse. At that time, West Virginia Radio Corporation had the rights to Marshall University, and he became their play-by-play announcer straight out of college. Then, after one year, went to Virginia Tech. He was the voice of the Hokies for 25 years, uh, went to UCLA for a year. Now he's back in Blacksburg as a faculty member. Um, so we've got just a ton of guys. Dave Pash, who I mentioned, met his yeah. wife in Morgantown. Uh, she was working in our uh, sales office, and so you got all these these mountaineer connections. I, my old roommates, like when I was living in Allentown, I felt like they would get so annoyed because every so often a person would come on TV, and I'd be like, "Oh, that person's from West Virginia," or like that person's cousin. Like, just felt like you could play six degrees of separation with almost anyone that's like big time, and and they somehow oh, yeah. have a connection. Oh yeah, there's. I, I always say this, man. There's always we always kid around on my show that there's always a West Virginia connection. And it really doesn't take that long or that it is that hard oftentimes to find some form of West Virginia connection. They're, they're all over the place. It's almost comical. Yeah, it's insane. I mean, like, I, I'd never forget one time I heard my roommate talking loudly on the phone one night. He was, I think he was just upset with the amount of people that I was naming because he was on the phone with a friend. And he was just like, he acts like I don't know people. I know people, too. It's just like people must get annoyed with this. <laughs> But you're from like the upstate New York area and everything. Did you ever have to drop? I'm just just from my personal knowledge. Did you ever have to drop like some sort of accent whenever you were getting into the game? You know, that's a good question. And not that I know of. So my brother speaks with a significant Western New York accent. We're from just outside of Buffalo. And Mm -hmm. so you can definitely tell he sounds different. Um, But I, for whatever reason, and I have no idea why, I never really had that western new york thing which kind of leans on long holding vowel sounds longer yeah it's almost um, like a flat is it like flat almost yeah like i only have to be around my brother for about seven seconds and i can talk exactly um like he talks but it's more you know hey what are you guys doing you doing like that doing you doing that was well, so i don't yeah, know yeah, what are yeah. you gonna do that that o becomes a ooh, and everything's a little bit longer but no i didn't fortunately i didn't have to because I, I have a good friend of mine from Utica, and he just seems like he has just this weird combination where sometimes he sounds like he's, he's in old school Brooklyn, but other times he sounds like he's from up there. Yeah, see, because he's on the he's on that line of designation. So he's sent Utica Central. So he doesn't know whether he's like a New York City guy or whether he's in the middle over there toward Rochester where it's the same thing. <laughs> right. So he, he's caught in no man's land. Right, right. And then you're just stuck with a weird accent where nobody knows where you're from. You have no home. Exactly. Yeah, precisely. You have a very interesting background. You you have a distinct love of, of food, and I think that stems from your time working in a, a grocery store. Am I correct? Well, it's, it's a nice way to say it was working, Frank. What, what it was was indentured servitude. Uh, I was born <laughs> right. into a grocery store. I didn't have a choice. Uh, my parents owned a grocery store right in the middle of a residential uh, neighborhood, old school grocery store. And that really was where I was raised. We didn't go to our house. We went to our house to go to sleep. 
but we were in the store. The, the store was open from nine in the morning until 10 at night and seven days a week. And the employees were our family. So that's literally where we lived. So as a result of that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm totally fluent in the food world. We also had, besides being a grocery store, we had a, a 25 foot lunch counter. We sold pizzas, subs, soft serve ice cream and all that kind of stuff. And so as a result of that, I've been around that uh, my whole life. And as I've gotten older, I've loved to kind of dabble around in the kitchen and cook stuff. That's something I need to get into. Man. I find myself late at night. I look at the at the clock and it's like 2.30 and I'm watching Gordon Ramsay whip something up. And I know in my mind I can never do this, but I just I want to get into nah. it. Now, see, here's the, see, you're suffering from the same exact thing that my son, two of my sons, the twins suffer from, like they think when you go in there and you cook something like you're trying to, I think their perception is that you're trying to split an atom and it's not that difficult. In fact, about a couple of hours or so ago, I made lunch and Matthew, my son is here now. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, dude, uh, here we go. I'm going to make tuna melts. And so he was over in the other room doing his work. And I, he said, okay, just call me when they're done. So I make it. And I said, all right, it's done. So he comes over and he eats. And he goes, oh, my gosh, this is unbelievable. And I said, dude, do you know what I just did? I took an onion. I diced it. I took tomatoes, little cherry tomatoes. I quartered them. I took a handful of artichoke hearts. I cut them in half. All right. You're with me so far real hard. I mixed it with two bags of tuna. I doused it with olive oil. I put salt, oregano, basil in there. You with me? That's all I did. I stirred it. Really good stir on it. A little more olive oil. Keep it moist. I got bread I, that I make and I gave that some olive oil. So far, so easy, right? I just mixed five things, right. whatever it was. Right. I put it on top of the bread. I took some extra sharp provolone. And I layered it on top of the uh, on top of the tuna. I had mm -hmm. my broiler on. I put it in the broiler for five minutes. The broiler with the high, high heat explodes that cheese. It melts down on top of that. It gives it great moisture. It gives it great flavor. That was it. I mean, that's not, but it tastes like off the chart. It's unbelievably good. Now, homemade bread also helps it. But and I said, that's what, why couldn't you do that? You can do that. So I think a lot of times people get i'm sure i do too with various things you know like uh here uh do this oh i could never do that no you can do it just go stick your face in the fire nothing's gonna happen and you'll be fine you can do it I, that's that's probably you know now that we brought this up this will probably become a life goal for me is to make sure franklin that you become a competent cook and make great stuff i'll probably or maybe you goal. could you could make another book karidi karidi cooks Maybe Karidi cookbooks, start a whole line. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, no, that's a possibility. Uh, that's a possibility. There's a lot of cookbooks out there, but um, I, I would. I mean, if you come over, if you ever get like witness protection where they let you out of the house again, um, right. you come over here and um, it's so simple. I, we can show you about five things. Um, yeah, really super simple everything. that taste really good. My, my nephew is a... A professional chef who went to Culinary Institute of America, CIA, that you probably, if you do watch a lot of cooking shows, that's kind of the uh, the the Harvard of mm -hmm. cooking schools. And the thing, he's a New York City chef, and the things that he makes are, they make me go like, what? <laughs> the pictures, I mean, his stuff looks like art. Like, do you eat it or do you hang it on your wall? And yeah, I don't know so how to eat he's some of this stuff. Yeah, see, he's at a different, he's at a whole different world where he, what the stuff he does, I'm, I'm much more of a, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, just super comfort food would probably mm -hmm. be it. Yeah, you're, you're cooking to eat. You're not cooking to like make it a whole experience type of thing, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, just like I want great, I want to, I want to make something that tastes so good that people just go like, oh my gosh. That's what I, that's the only thing I, that's, that's my, that's all I want. That's, yeah. my, that's all I want. Well, the scene that you set where you're talking about, I cut an onion. I, I quartered these 
cherry tomatoes and whatnot. I'm just picturing it. And you're like in a 90s movie and maybe we play Dean Martin in the background. It's a, it's a montage. It's a oh. classic montage scene. I, I can <laughs> picture it. Yeah. Yeah. Baseball hat on backward. Uh, apron on. Yeah, it's good. It's we could good. get that's, Tom that's Hanks to play you. It'd be like, uh, I don't know, like picture him in Money Pit. It's like that where he's fixing things. Yeah, oh, right, right along there. Yeah, I'm sure Hanks. I'm sure <laughs> Hanks is looking for that. Yeah, exactly. You're the bread baking champion in the world, and there might be a little bit of collusion. Uh, old uh, <laughs> kneecaps, Caridi. Did you have to put the the muscle on anyone to get no. a vote? It was so. What that was, there's a competition, and I started messing around with bread probably two years ago, and a gentleman here in Morgantown showed us. Uh, his recipe. And it really, when I ate it, I went like, oh my gosh, I got to be able to do this. And so I ventured off into a different style, which is called no need. And it's a slow rise. It's a, it's a 12 to 18 hour rise. So you'd basically make your dough the day before, and then you make bread the next day. Anyway, so a buddy of mine also got into it. He's a buddy of mine. He's He's a doctor here in Morgantown. And so we started, you know, making bread. And so these, I travel in this pack of um, a bunch of guys that all, all of their names end in a vowel. And so <laughs> they, they, everything's got to be a competition. So I said, well, we got to have a competition. So we had a bread showdown and it was, you had to make an artesian loaf. You had to make a focaccia and you had a baker's choice. Mm-hmm. And so I went the artesian, I made a carrot, raisin bread, and the focaccia. And it came down literally the judges, three panel, three, three panel, the judges, three guys. It came down to the focaccia. And my guy, my competitor, his focaccia was a little, uh, it was a little tall, a yep. little airy. And mine, because I wasn't in my home kitchen, mine was a little narrow. And so it came down to that. And my guy sided with me just by a hair on the focaccia. So I have, I do have a trophy of a, uh, of a fat chef with a chef's hat on above my sink, which is pretty nice. So, and so he, like- and let me tell you, that was controversial because Dr. Gary, who lost the competition, he was incensed. And he went around all over the place trying to prove that my bread, my focaccia was too short. And I made the contention that his looked more like Wonder Bread. And Mm. so he went to France and he texted me a picture from France of buying focaccia in a bakery. And he had a tape measure next to it trying to show me that French. Yeah. So it got to that level. I'm not giving the trophy back. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) <laughs> this trophy he said it's like a big fat guy with a mustache yeah it's, so yeah. it's just like something you would see at like a just a classic pizza joint some guy with like a menu yes sign. exactly yes yes that's the same guy that's the same guy. <laughs> that guy's yeah. everywhere man that guy oh yeah, he, yeah he's, he's universal he's all over the place yeah I'm, I'm i mean i know the restaurant business is tricky but i think if i get my name out there big enough franco's restaurante that's not bad i'm not even italian but franco's come on uh, you'd be bankrupt in less than five months. Well, not if I get the big fat Italian trophy. No, just saying. You. no, no, no. Just saying. Hardest business in the world. Oh, uh, restaurants. And we're seeing, obviously we're seeing it now with what's going on um, with the pandemic. But even when things are, are well, that is probably day in and day out the absolute most difficult uh business to survive and it's so so it's so hard it's so fickle among consumers um i'll I'll, you know i think the smart play for me is just stay in my kitchen and make me happy yeah gotta make got to uh put number one first i totally understand not to uh change gears entirely but it's going to be a not the most seamless transition here i want to get into West Virginia athletics, just a hair, because I'm assuming a lot of people that are clicking on this are like, oh, you know, Tony Curry, you got to talk about West Virginia sports. Um, something in the back of my mind, a question that I wanted to pose to you, is there an unsung Mountaineer? Is there like a guy that you thought did everything right and maybe didn't get a ton of praise? Is there is there a guy, any sport that you that you cover that you thought maybe is like an unsung hero type of character? 
Oh my gosh, there's probably a ton because probably what happens oftentimes is a lot of guys get more attention than they probably deserve. And then those guys that uh, deserve a lot of attention don't get any at all because they're kind of, you know, nameless. They just do their job, like you said. You know, I would probably think, you know, like in football, uh, the long snapper that never has a bad snap Mm -hmm. is a guy that no one ever talks about until some weird thing happens and he bounces one in and you miss a kick or he sells Mm -hmm. one over somebody's head, then all of a sudden everyone knows his name and just vilifies him. Um, But it's probably those guys. And we've had um, some really, really good long snappers um, through the years in Mountaineer football. I mean, we've had a ton of guys. Uh, You know, we just, uh, Rex Sunahara just ended. He was Mm -hmm. super good. Um, You know, uh, your guy, Cody. um, My guy, Mr. Nutter. Yeah, Cody Nutter. He, I mean, never said his name. I tried to say his name every time he got over the top of the ball because if it didn't say it then, he'd never say his name. You could just say snap comes back and no one would ever know. Scott right. Fleming was another kid that came from Texas. Um, he like he didn't have one bad snap in forever. So those guys are unheralded. I think in football, the kicking game is totally disrespected. It's mm-hmm. starting to get a little more love, but I think over the years – uh, they, I just never understood it that they put so much effort and time into everything else. And, you know, years ago, Franklin, they would rarely scholarship a kicker. It would just go like, ah, oh, we're going to take our chances with a walk on. Hopefully it works. Now they do. Right. But, you know, in the past, they were just like a, ne- an un- a necessary nuisance and no one cared. But if they missed a field goal, you know, they would just get crushed. But if they made it, hey, he made the field goal, he's a hero. So it's it's that's a weird world. It is. And, and you know, I definitely felt all the pressure in the world. Uh, I was a AAA high school kicker in West Virginia. I played in a big-time rivalry. I might have missed two kicks. It's no big deal. But I definitely uh, I know what it's like to, uh, you know, if you, if you miss, they all hate you. If you make it, okay. Where would you go to, South? Yeah, Parksburg South, the good one. And what uh, and what was your uh, what what was your um, your field goal stats as a senior? As a senior, I only played one year. It was my senior year. So here's the deal, Tony. So for the hey, Frank, first, just answer the question. What were you? What for what? I was. Hold on, hold on. For the first. No, I just know. I just, I'm, a, I'm a numbers guy. Give me the numbers first. And I know then you you're can not, tell your I'm story. a numbers guy. For the first five weeks of the season, I was the best kicker in the nation statistically. I want to point that out. I went. O of one field goal attempts. The whole season? Yeah, we only kicked one field goal because we were just getting our teeth kicked in all year, and coach never felt the need to get any sort of points on the board. Wow, you took you you, you took one field goal your whole year. Yeah, and I wow. still somehow had was, colleges talk to me from? just based on PATs and what, kickoffs. That's how good my leg was. What was the what was your missed field goal from? How far? Uh, I think it was like thirty two. Maybe I went back to that field from the same spot and made it. Did they count it? No, they didn't count it. No, I went back didn't. and did it after I like I graduated. I was just messing around on the field. No, I understand. No, I, I understood. No, yeah, I understood. But they still didn't count it. No, it wasn't counted. I mean, not yeah. that I know of. I mean, I can I keep yeah. hitting refresh on my stats on the recruiting profile and nothing showing up. So okay, I got you. I got you. Now the the call that you do on field goals is that like a thing in the sports and like the sportscaster world? Do you have like your own set like because you do this bellowing the kick is like that is locked <laughs> into my childhood brain? Is that like a thing that sportscasters have? Like this is their call? Like hey, no one else does the kick is because that's Tony's call. No, I never even thought of that. To be quite honest with you, I didn't even know that you had a perception that I had like a call. I I didn't know. I mean, it's it's relatively, you're just describing what you see, right? Snap comes back, kicks on the way, and then you're waiting. And it is, and the is, you're waiting. Did it go or not go? And you're looking at the officials, and it is good. And the good varies on the length of the field goal, right? So right. if it's something you're supposed to make. And we had one, it was Casey, uh, Casey this past year. Leg. Casey Legg, exactly. Casey Legg, who's an unbelievable story, as you know, because he didn't play high school football. That could have been me, Tony. That That could have been me. Yeah, exactly. He hit that bomb. Was it 52? It was a long one. It was a long one. Yeah, I think it was was 52. 
And so on that one, you kind of look at it and go like, chances are this doesn't go. And so I think that at the end of the call, you hear the level of number one, that's a big boy kick and mm-hmm. the level of excitement that goes along with hitting a 52 yarder, especially for, you know, for a kid like that. I mean, you definitely went up a few octaves on the like, good, like you went up. I liked it. It showed very strong vocal range. I'm, I'm a fan of it. <laughs> yeah, but no, I never, I never thought that I had that. It's you know saying the same thing. I try to you know, try to you try to vary some things up. I honestly, I I could have sworn that there was like like <laughs> some sort of like unspoken code between sportscasters. It's like, hey, that's Tony kick is. I I thought that was like your signature thing. No, I'll, I'll go with it though. If you say yeah. so, hopefully, we'll, hopefully, I'll be able to use it in the not too distant future. Hopefully, we play. In the oh not my too gosh, yeah. Future. I mean, I was watching old highlights just to get into the mood, and I am, I am s- such a, a a fan of Neil Brown, and you know, I, I like Dana too. But th- here's the deal, Tony. Uh, Dana was the perfect coach for my college years. I was in college when when Dana was like all four and a half years. Yes, I went four and a half. It's no big deal. Whatever. Still class of twenty eighteen. Uh. I, I went, uh, like, it was a perfect time because Dana was always like, live fast, play hard, that type of thing. And now that I've graduated and Neil's come in, it's like, hey, we can have fun, but let's also be sensible about this. Neil's like a, a nice older brother figure for me. <laughs> well, I think that uh, I think that Neil and the staff are going to win really, really um, big. And I think it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of time. I've been tremendously impressed with the organization and the plan that he has installed and we're still in the midst of it right so i think the trust the climb theme is really really uh, ap- uh, apropos to what's going on and uh, I- i'm totally um, thrilled by the fact that he's here i think they've handled this current suspension of uh, practice uh, unbelievably well i've talked to literally every member of the staff on my show and you can just get the sense that they uh, from an organizational uh, perspective are all over this thing not only with the kids that are currently on the team but in the recruiting that they're doing so we're going to be it's not a matter of, of if as i said it's just a matter of when this thing clicks and it's coming yeah i mean like you know you had all, all the pundits saying and all the uh, vegas bookmakers and all that stuff you know the fact that we won five games last year that was pretty impressive yeah, because you had so much unknown. Um, whenever you have a coaching change, there's a huge unknown. And then when you don't have a starting quarterback returning, that in college football is is huge. You get so much transition. I mean, you've got. Uh, I mean, think about it. Like, um, you know, well, you're you're too young to remember uh, the Brady Bunch, but think about a mixed family, right? That that uh, I watched the Brady Bunch. Of, I watched the Brady. Okay, Bunch. cool. Okay, cool. So you know how that goes, right? So they, they bring the boys and the girls together and they all of a sudden they merge this family. I mean, on a very large scale, that's what happens when football coaching changes happen. Uh, you've got these parents and that are the assistants and the head coach and they leave and all of a sudden all these new bodies come in and new players that they bring with them and coaches come in and it's just like this, wow. Mm-hmm. And so to get through your first season and get the wins that they had, and they left a couple out there, certainly. Um, but to get the wins that you had and to play well at the end of the season, as they did uh, with the victories that they had mm-hmm. against K-State and TCU, uh, to me, uh, that was about as good as they could have done. I was I was over the moon whenever we got to play spoiler to TCU. They didn't get to go to a bowl game. I love ruining people's parties. Wow. That's a little harsh. A little harsh, Franklin, but no, I, I'm with you. I'm kidding. Um, it was a great win. Uh, and you might, well, like, that was a six win team or whatever they were, a five win team. That was a great win to be able with everything that was going on at that time. And that was an amazing catch uh, by Esdale. Um, you know, the way he caught that ball and it pop out of there, that, you know, and didn't move the meter nationally, didn't move, uh, you know, the needle at all. But Mm-mm. to me, that was a huge, huge win to go into post. Uh, post regular season part of this part of the schedule if there is a season this year i'm sure you know more about that stuff than i do um i mean like what uh, do you think there would be like i don't know like a 
you'd hate to put a number on it, but at least like a, a two win improvement. Do you think like seven would be a reasonable number with the with the team that we have now? I don't know what the number is, but I, I think a bowl would be yeah. the next step. For it. I think that's what that would that would be. So whatever that might be, if that's six, is that seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever. Um, I think, and again, we're, we're talking about this and we don't even know how many games the regular season will actually have this year, right? So, um, but if we could get to some form of a bowl, if in fact we do have bowl games this year, I think that would be the next step in the progression. Yeah, I'd kill for a cheese it bowl or whatever they call it now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> some sponsor. Uh, one last thing, you know, I, I, you're a very busy man. Got you can have uh, various shows to do and stuff like that. You also uh teach some. Not a lot of people know that. And one thing that you have your students do, which I find incredibly interesting, is you put up on monitors games of Madden where the computer's playing the computer, and you have the students call the game. Uh, I used to call games of Madden when I was playing as a kid and my mom would just walk by and think I was an insane person. <laughs> yeah. To me, the hardest thing, let's go just talk play by play in general. So in order to do anything successfully, you have to have repetition, right? Of the, of whatever it might be. If it's changing a tire, then you need to do it. Uh, you know, the, the 75th time you change a tire is incredibly more efficient than the first time. And that follows in anything that we do. The same goes for play by play. The difficulty in that is that there are so few number of times that an announcer can improve, for example, in football. I mean, if you were to do a football season and you're doing high school, right? At best, it's like, you know, 10 games ish at most, 10 chances. That's all you get. And you have to wait another year to get going again. And the same goes, you know, basketball, obviously there's more opportunities, but not a ton more. If you got 25 basketball games in on a season, that'd be a ton. Video games to me are the absolute best uh, simulator that you could have. It was a great creation. It's an unintended consequence of the video game world because you can put, as you said, uh, two teams together, let the computer play itself, and you can sit back there and prepare just as if you were doing a regular game with you know, spotting charts and knowing who the people are, the personnel, and you can riff off that thing, man, and just go and go and go and go. And I think there's, uh, I think there's tremendous value uh, to do that be- for a bunch of different reasons. So that's kind of um, that's kind of how we got to that. And then they, I found it just by accident. I was over at the uh, football stadium one day and I walked by the guys in the video room. Those are the guys that shoot practice and then break down everything. And I walked in and they have a huge monitor in there and they had a video game on that they were messing around with. And I looked up at it and it just blew me out because I hadn't looked in a while at video games and the Mm -hmm. resolution and the quality of it was so lifelike. And I said, Hey, let me ask you a question. Can you make that thing, uh, give me an angle where it's like at midfield? Boom, boom. Yeah, it's easy. It's this. Um, can you take the announcers out of the mix and just play crowd? Yeah. Boom, boom. They do that. I said, okay, do that. And they started showing me and I went like, there it is. I mean, so all of a sudden, you know, you can, you just, you just go, I mean, you know, here's, uh, you know, they, they, here's, uh, you know, here come the Eagles first down and 10 from the 25 yard line. They send two receivers over the right single receiver to the left receiver comes in motion, left to right single setback. Here's the handoff running off the right side. I mean, you can do that for like hours. And those are the reps that you need to get to get that rhythm, that frequency, that, that comfortable quality that only comes through a long period of time and so to me that was like bing 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 and I shared that with my buddy who I mentioned earlier who's now teaching at Virginia Tech and he's done the same thing with his classes and they've taken it you know and they're doing they're doing awesome things with it and so it's really neat so what we would do long answer to your short question is we'd pair the kids in twos and we had 14 in a group and so seven groups of two and we just crank the heck out of the natural sound in the room. And so you don't hear the other guys on theirs. And they just they go straight into their phone on voice recorder. And 
done. They submit the tape and they can go back, listen to it, and it helps tremendously. Do you have these kids do scene setters? Because I would love for like, it's a snowy yes. night in Lambeau Field, and da da da, and yeah. they do this. I think yeah, that'd yeah, be yeah. funny. Yeah, um, it's a uh, it is a brisk Friday evening at Parkersburg South High School. Don't don't do as it. The Patriots take to the field. Dun, no. dun, dun, dun. and what? No, I thought you were going to say. And Franklin it. Miller misses another kick. Yes, no, no, I was going to. And this game rests on one toe and one tone only, that of Franklin Miller. Dun, 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 right? This is haunting my nightmares. To have Tony Caridi call my name. At 6'1 and 118 pounds. Franklin now will attempt to put the Patriots on his back. Yeah, I could see it happening. Yeah, we could do that. To be fair, we lost by like 13 points, okay? And I missed a field goal in the first quarter. It's not my fault. Against Parkersburg? Yes. Yeah, against the Big Red, huh? Well, that'll happen. Yeah. That'll happen. Uh, um, It's just uh, funny that you, you know, have these the, the kids call the games and stuff like that because one last story here and I'll let you go. Andy came over to my apartment one time in college and we were watching a mid-summer Pirates game that made, like, it, it, I mean, it... People don't have any idea who An- people don't know who Andy is. Well, I didn't Who's know Andy? if you, Andy, your son Andy, a, a great talented. Oh, and, and, what's Andy that? Joe Fat Cheeks? Andy Joe Fat Cheeks. That was That's his baby name. Him? Andy Joe Fat Cheeks. Yeah, Andy Joe Fat Cheeks. Yeah. Okay. Well, Andy Joe Fat Cheeks, who yeah. is an incredible sportscaster in his own right, came over to my apartment one time, turned off the broadcasters of the Pirates game, and was just calling this game in my living room. It was an incredible experience. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's you know i'll tell you what's incredible and this is true when he was young and i'm not exaggerating he didn't talk so he would say a hundred words in one week that would be a big week and i'm not being funny mm-hmm. he never talked he was like the most chill quiet dude so when he told me he wanted to be a play-by-play announcer i i truly said to him i said you understand play-by-play announcers talk and he goes, yeah, yeah, I know. I got it. I got it. I can do it. Yeah, I can do it. So, yeah, he's done really, really well. I'm excited to see where his career goes because, like I said, he's very talented. But uh, all all of your uh, sons has helped me out a lot. Matt, uh, obviously we had the old episode, Andy, and then Big Mike tried to give me a lot of life advice when I was coming out of college. So I greatly appreciate all the information that they give given to me, and I greatly appreciate you letting me interview you today, Tony. It's my pleasure. I really appreciate it, buddy. Um, episode 50, into the book. Thanks uh, very much for having me on. Thank you. And as always, remember to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at FrankOsWorld underscore. Um, that about does it. So that about puts a bow on it. So thank you all very much for listening. I hope you have a great day, and I will see you when I see you.